Bakenkek to come and say a welcome to the Mi'kmaq territory and a prayer. No, I hope that don't fall. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate all my sisters in uh, completing their um, program, their diploma program in leadership. Um, and I would like to welcome all the people that have traveled uh, from across Canada to come and help celebrate this day with them. I'm very honored today to be able to come up here and speak with you and pray with you. Uh, in our old and sacred ways. <clears throat> so welcome everybody to Mi'kmaq territory. And I'm honored. I was, I've been here for the last couple of weeks with uh, the girls, my sisters, and uh, watched them transform and I was like really honored and inspired by their work and by the work of Sheila and Brenda and everyone that took part this week and the, it, the weeks before to, uh, to get them to this day. And I'm, I'm really blown away at uh, what a wonderful, wonderful job they did and how beautiful they all are and how beautiful they look today. I'm, I'm very, very happy. And I learned something new, but I, I don't think I can show you. <laughs> um, so let, uh, let's, let's lead this, let's start this prayer. And um, I'm sure all our girls are anxious to get, get moving and They've got family and loved ones at home that they're anxious to get to, and we'll pray for pray for them. Okay. Ontangashala, grandfathers, grandmothers. I want to give you thanks for today. I want to give you thanks for all the hard work that our sisters have put into uh, reaching their goal and getting here today. I want to give you thanks, Tonkashla, for all the leaders in this program that have took the time and effort into helping each one of them, even at night time. I pray, Tonkashla, that uh, you walk with each one of them as they go home and back into their communities. And I pray that all the things that they've learned here uh, to be leaders, they take that to their communities and they continue their work there. And I give you thanks, Tonkashla, for uh, answering some prayers of ours that for many years we've been praying for uh, leadership in our youth. And today I stand here, Tonkashla, amongst 20 beautiful women that are going to go home and uh, lead their community in a good way. So I give you thanks for that, Tankashla. I give you thanks for many things today and ask that everybody, Tankashla, has a safe journey home to their family, to their loved ones, and continue guiding them in a good way. All my relations. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Sheila Isaac, and I am the program manager of the Indigenous Women in Community Leadership Program. Each year, it's my honor to be a part of this program. And each year, I get to meet more women who help me shape my life as much as they think I shape theirs. 
I'd like to um, thank um, everybody who's taken the time to come here today. And I'd like to make a special um, thank you to a few people here in the room. Sister Dorothy Moore, thank you for being part of the program. Thank you for coming here. Uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you to the Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick, Graydon Nicholas, and his wife Beth, who are both graduates of St. FX, and who also, I believe, um, Graydon is a graduate of the Cody. No? Okay. So he's, a, he's always around, and he's a pretty much a, a great um, honor to have with us and to support this program and other programs that the Cody puts on and St. Francis Xavier as well. I'd like to say welcome to the new president of uh, St. Francis Xavier University, Kent McDonald. Thank you for being here. I'd also like to thank Lorna Carlson from Imperial Oil, who has traveled from Calgary to be here. Uh, Randy DeLore, who is a new uh, member of parliament, I believe, or MLA. So thank you for being here, Randy. I'd also like to thank the mayor, Carl Chisholm, for being here as well. Thank you. I don't want to miss anybody, so I have to look at my notes a little bit. I'm not sure if any of the chiefs are here, but if they are here, I'd like to thank you for being here. Um, my eyesight's not going good today. <laughs> so um, thank you, special guests, and thank you, um, community members from Antigonish, from Eskasoni, from Rima, from Peguis, First Nation in Manitoba, for all of the people that work at Dakota who have supported this program. And uh, I would like to make a special thank you to Brenda, my assistant, who makes me look really good, to tell you the truth. It's all the behind the scenes job that uh, really we don't see. I also see members of Buck and Keck here as well, so I'd like to welcome you as well. The Cody Diploma students, I see some in the room and I, I thank you for being here as well and they come from all over the world. So we have lots of guests here and I'd like to also say thank you to um, Jonathan Langdon. <laughs> Heather, other St. FX uh, professors here at the university, Monica Deocean that I work very closely with, and um, I see you Richard, Richard Nemesfari as well. Family members, thank you for coming here to be with your daughters, your sisters, your aunties, your moms, and uh, I'd also like to say that uh, a special Thank you for Hubba for being here after having surgery just a couple of weeks ago. We couldn't keep her away. <laughs> and um, so we thank you and Judy and Emmett for being here. So thank you so much. Every year I have the honor to work with these ladies and work with the mentors as well who are from across Canada. And every year I always say, these ladies are meant to be here. I believe that the Creator has made it that way. It doesn't, it's not because we chose them and we did a selection committee and a selection process. I believe that we are always in ceremony within this program. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful that I'm a part of it because it is so beautiful to be a part of. I'd like to um, introduce to the stage Dr. John Gaventa, who has always sat and listened to me, really, <laughs> um, if anybody knows me. <laughs> and he, um, he's very thoughtful in what he has to say in every speech I've heard him say. And it's always an honor for him to come and speak to the class of 2014. And I welcome you to the stage.
Thank you so much, Sheila, and thank you for your leadership in the program. Um, thanks, Judy. Thanks, Desi, for the powerful song that you welcomed us with. So as director of the Cody Institute and, and vice president of St. FX University, it's my pleasure to congratulate the graduates of the 2014 class of Indigenous Women and Community Leadership Program. Let's congratulate them. I remember only a short time ago in that last week of April when you first arrived here, many of you, anxious to learn, maybe a little nervous, and now here you are, a few months later, you graduate as the fourth class of the IWICL program. And in so doing, you join IWICL graduates, incredible women, now across every province and territory in Canada, to use your skills as they do and your leadership as they do on behalf of building your communities. It's a great honor to have you here. It's a great honor to welcome you, and it's a great honor to see you off and know what else you will do in the coming years. Thanks also to our elders. I join Sheila and others, and um, Mary. It's always wonderful to have you here. Judy, it's been great to have you here in this time. We acknowledge our presence on traditional Mi'kmaq territory, and we thank you for your welcome and the support that you and members of Buck and Keck and others have given our participants throughout their time here. All of us read the news, and I don't want to go forward without taking a moment to acknowledge that while we're here to celebrate the accomplishments of these incredible women graduates, we also remember that across Canada, there are hundreds of missing or murdered Indigenous women who are not with us today. We pay special tribute to the family and friends of Loretta Sanders, the 26-year-old Inuit woman from Labrador, a student at Dalhousie, who was murdered earlier this year. We also pay tribute to the sister of Michelle Pierre, one of our IWICL participants last year, who is still missing. May we take a moment of silence to honor these women. Thank you. Let me join Sheila also in thanking other participants and, and, uh, for coming and thanking those of you across the university community, Dr. McDonald, members of the community here in St. FX and Antigonish for your support for this wonderful program. I also want to thank a few others. First of all, thanks to our mentors who have already been mentioned. You have done so much to champion the graduation, the grads, and to give valuable leadership and support while they're here at Cody and during their community placements. For those of you who don't know, some in, we have some in 20 wonderful indigenous women mentors from across the country who've been involved in the program and a number of them are here today. Could I ask you to stand please? It's always a pleasure to receive your wisdom with us here at Cody. I'd like to thank the communities who welcomed the participants. They came in April and May. They went back to their communities or other communities. They carried out projects with dozens, if not hundreds, of other people. And those communities also supported these women. A big thank of, thanks, of course, to the facilitators and the staff of the IWICL program, um, Sheila, Brenda, the Women's Center, all the staff who are here, your efforts have, made a, have created a tremendously powerful and encouraging and supportive learning environment. I'd also like to express thanks to Lorna. Lorna, thanks for coming. Lorna Carlson, the Vice President of Imperial Oil Foundation. We thank Imperial Oil not only for your financial support, but for the supportive way that you have partnered with us and with our participants now throughout this four years of this program. But most of all to the graduates, your presence, your energy, your dedication have been a pleasure to observe 
and to share with you here at Cody. I thoroughly enjoyed my chance to talk to you about my favorite topic, the power cube and power within. Um, and it's also been wonderful to receive the, the spirit and to feel the vibrations that uh, you shared with us across Cody as you gathered, gathered in the TP, carried out some ceremonies, and had your wonderful discussions and presentations. Most of you began the program in April, though we were happy this year to welcome some of you back from the previous year. And over the last few months, you've been dedicated to increasing your skills as community leaders. You supported one another in a space that allowed you to examine what indigenous women leadership really means and how you can now use your leadership to support your communities. You've put your new knowledge and skills into practice already through your field projects, and now you will look forward to use what you have learned in the years and even decades ahead. If you look at the IWICL logo here on either side of us, you will see the artwork of Melissa S. Labrador, a Mi'kmaq artist. The image, image shows three generations of women standing on Mother Earth with the roots below the soil. The message in this painting, I think, is that all life is connected below the surface and held together by the roots of trees. When we increase our knowledge and increase our skills, we establish stronger roots. And as we connect with each other, we develop lasting bonds that foster strong communities. This is what you have done. You are the latest to join a sisterhood of 57 amazing graduates from this program, who in turn are part of a growing network of amazing indigenous women who seek to be part of real change in this country and to support each other in doing so. The work of these 57 women has already extended to some 67 First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities across nine provinces and two territories. Your voices are amplifying and are going stronger at a time in Canada's history when it is critical that your voices are heard. As you return home, I hope you'll take with you also a sense of the global community that you've experienced in Cody including with some of our diploma and global change leaders from around the world and have been able to share a bit of time with you. As you graduate, you will join the 6,500 other Cody graduates working for change in 130 other nations across the world. So on behalf of all of St. FX and of Cody Institute, I want to congratulate you again for completing the community leadership program. As the roots of women's leadership, just like these, which are gained from the IWICL program, continue to deepen and spread, I'm confident that your impact will be felt in communities across the country and across the globe. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Dr. Gaventa. I want to talk a little bit about the program for those of you who don't know what we do in the Indigenous Women and Community Leadership Program. I want to let you know that we have, it's a four-month certificate program, and it's open to any Aboriginal women across this country. We start in May, and in May we have, actually we start before May. <laughs> we start off with uh, application process, and we have uh, three Aboriginal women who sit on the selection process, and we look through all of the applications that come through, and we look for people women who have done some volunteer work in their community and who want to build upon the capacity in their, com in their community, whether it be Inuit, Métis, or First Nation. The importance of that is so clear to everybody across this country that the people who do make the differences in this world are women. And it's the women who are going to change these communities. We recognize that through this program. And in May, when they arrive, they come from all over and they heard things about the program and they've read the website and they're, um, you know, they, they know someone maybe who's been in the program or they might know a mentor or they might know me. And they come to this program not knowing each other, 
but it's very clear right from the beginning that it's so important. That's the most important part of this whole program is that they connect with each other and share their stories, their experiences in work and home and life. They share their culture, their languages, their traditions. And it's always so nice to see them at ease with each other. We offer in the program a three week, it's only every Monday, but every Monday they learn about project management. And they do this each week to build upon a three month outline of what their project is going to be. Then they learn about Aboriginal history from a First Nation, Métis and Inuit perspective. And I feel that that's so important that they learn from First Nation, Inuit and Métis women leaders women who can talk about their timeline and talk about their histories, traditions and culture. They also learn about leadership and this year and last year we were very lucky to have Carolyn Paul who is a 2011 graduate, a friend of mine, a hard worker. She didn't get there because she graduated from the program, she got there because she brings with it so much knowledge and thought and caring and passion. Because Aboriginal women have passion. They have passion to change this world we live in. So she teaches the leadership component that builds their leadership in all different ways because if you think leadership only comes in one way, you're wrong. In the second week, they learn about asset-based community development. Uh, Tanya Wasa case, maybe she's here. I don't see. So she's, um, she, along with Mary Beth Doucette from Member 2, taught the asset-based community development course. And that's all about train to trainer, teaching your community about how to pull out its assets, all of the great things that your community has through its people, through its associations, organizations, through its um, leadership. Assets come in many different forms, even in the natural resources. They learn that over the course of a week and we make a field trip to a First Nation every year. This year we went to Indian Brook First Nation about an hour and a half from here towards the airport. We went into that community in one day and we did all kinds of asset mapping. We, got, we had youth there, we had women there, we had elders there and they were able to build maps and it was really cool to see how the kids made their map as opposed to seeing how the older people in the community made their map. But it was all their community. They pulled out those assets and we were able to build a little bit of capacity in one day. In the third week, we learn about something called positive interpersonal engagement strategies. And that's so important because life is all about relationships. And I always say that, I feel like a broken record when I say that, but life is all about relationships. We talk about lateral violence. You know, lateral violence is some, sometimes a new term for people. And what that is, is when we start putting each other down within our own culture, not letting people rise above themselves. So we let them know that this form of bullying, it's not necessary. It's not part of growth in any community. They learn about that and they also learn a little bit about research capacity building because some of these ladies do research projects. This year we have a lady who's not returning this year because she has to deal with a health issue with her eyes so she wasn't able to fly here. But she worked on a really awesome project. It was called Intercultural Communication and Leadership. And it's all about communicating with indigenous people about their land, their land rights, their treaties, their natural resources. Other projects that we had included Iroquois Ancestral Food Guide, Aboriginal People into Trades, a resource guide for youth at risk, Aboriginal youth at risk, an Aboriginal resource guide for Red Deer, Alberta. 
ABCD, which is asset-based community development, what I talked about, in a few of the communities like Musquatchies, like Sucker Creek, Fort William First Nations. We also worked on an urban Aboriginal resource book for Thunder Bay. One of the ladies put on a two-day conference in Musquatchies and used her own people to pull that conference off, which was a big success. We had people talking about waste management and the protection of bears. The Edmonton Aboriginal Songwriter Series, which turned into a songwriter showcase called Ignite Your Creativity in Edmonton, Alberta. Environmentally Friendly Project in Turtle Lodge in Saugeen, Manitoba. Our Voice, Our Way, an Aboriginal Women's Empowerment Group, a journey of discovering growth, growth in Edmonton. And the um, Community Foundation in Rama, Ontario. All these projects and more have shaped our group, our class this year, shaped our mentors, shaped our elders, by hearing what they had done, what they completed. When the ladies returned back in August, after being away for three months to work on these projects, they come back and they learn about public speaking skills. They also learn about proposal writing and how to build upon their opportunity to take advantage of a $10,000 community leverage fund. So that's a little bit about what the program is all about. And each year, we also have somebody who presents their project. And this year, we have Fawn Pettifer, who's going to talk to you about her project that she worked on over the last three months. Fawn. I'd like to welcome you all here today. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen to my words. Rowan White is a Mohawk writer and farmer. He said, Seeds encompass more than just characteristics. They are sacred heirlooms, witnesses to the past. Seeds hold cultural value, cultural memory, they are a vital part of traditional history and culture. Seeds themselves become symbols, reflecting of the people's spirituality and aesthetic identity, and the land which shaped them. So I ask you this question. What would happen if the seeds disappear Ani, Fawn Pettifer Dishnikaz. I'm a member, my name is Fawn Pettifer. I'm a member of Wanapate First Nation in Ontario. Having a permaculture garden, community garden project was the best thing I ever did for my community, for myself, for my environment, and for my cultural history. Let me explain why. I started by creating a design reflecting the change that was needed to essentially change a dead piece of land into a living one. So I chose an energy vortex. An energy vortex is, well, it kind of looks like a class five tornado. The plants were then carefully chosen, and they were chosen for their traditional food significance, compatibility with other plants, and hardiness. By the time I was done, my design changed from looking like an energy vortex into a funny looking alien. 
The land was blessed through a ceremony that was led by one of the 13 grandmothers, Margaret Bayon. I met Margaret at a, a workshop. I wanted her to bless my garden. I didn't have to coax her at all. She came to my mother's property. She did a ceremony asking Creator to bless my garden. Three generations were present. My mother, my niece, and myself. To our surprise, before the ceremony even started, an eagle flew overhead. But something else incredible happened as well. Early on in the spring, a tree fell right on the diagonal line of the 11 by 13 garden oval outline. So I buried it. I figured, you know, I might as well make a medicine, or medicine wheel out of it. So I found another fallen tree and I buried it to cross the first tree. So I have a medicine wheel underneath my garden. As the layers were laid, I envision a newborn baby being wrapped for its nap. The first layer of topsoil, 12 inches. Second layer of garden soil, 2 inches. One inch of compost. One bag of lime. One box of bone meal. A layer of newspaper. Then straw. Then manure. Nice, warm baby. <laughs> Stones, a hand, fist, large, outlined the eyes and the mouth. Wanting them to be happy, seeds were planted with loving mates, comfrey with trees, three sisters, beets with potatoes, potatoes with peas. Like a mother, I watched their birth, for their birth. Butterflies, bees, and insects left their mark as time went by. My mother said she never heard so many birds sing such beautiful songs before. Then one day, little green stubs poked through. It was a welcomed and joyful sight. So why would I spend all of this time on my community garden project. I once heard a story from an elder. Before the seeds are planted, we would put them in our mouth. We mix the seed with our DNA through our spit. Then we take the seed out and plant it. The seeds would come to know us as the DNA from our spit was absorbed. <clears throat> when it was time for the plant to grow, it would remember. It would grow remembering what we told it. And then it would provide what our bodies were lacking. In a world where we are lulled into wanting the finer things that this world has to offer, we sometimes forget just how important that connection to our food really is. Miigwech. I don't have a vote on who gets to do their project, but I have to tell you that I can't wait to put that seed in my mouth and leave my DNA on the next thing I plant. <laughs> I was like imagining myself full of seeds because my father has a big garden. <laughs> Thank you, Fawn.
Hey, hey, hey. 